Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the third annual roast of Ludlow Porch. I'm Dave Folk of AM 750 WSB. It's a delight to have each and every one of you here. I know it was a wonderful dinner. Let's give the Knights of Columbus a big hand and Malir's Barbecue. Yeah! Got that! Done. Malir's, the home of committed pigs. That's right. Well, it's, it's always a pleasure to gather together and really make fun and ridicule and embarrass your friends, isn't it? And that's exactly what we're going to do tonight. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce the first roaster. Here is a lady who is terminally chirpy. This woman has the best attitude, the most disgusting best attitude of anybody early in the morning that I've ever run across in my born days. Miriam Moyd. You know, Miriam, yeah, right here, right there. You see, I know why Miriam Moad is so doggone chirpy all the time. She comes through the newsroom, la la la, four o'clock in the morning. You want to choke her. You know what happened to Miriam? She's the daughter of gypsies who abandoned her at a 7-Eleven in Lovejoy. And she was raised by an optimist club, I'm sure. We really wonder sometime in the newsroom, you know, we're kind of a cynical lot anyway, we wonder if Miriam's really an axe murderer who's uh, on a, maybe a witness protection program or something, you know. Miriam is also disgustingly cute at 4 o'clock in the morning. I don't know how anybody can look that good that early in the morning. But will you please give a nice Ludlow Porch Roast welcome to WSB's Miriam Moad. I don't know what going first means, but I hope this kicks it off well. I'm really delighted to be here. And, you know, I love Ludlow Porch so much. I was really surprised to learn this week that he's a very sensitive man. I was surprised. I think we should be pretty nice to him tonight after I've learned just how sensitive he is. It was just yesterday that Ludlow was telling me he was pretty concerned. And please forgive me for using Ludlow's own words. He was a little worried that I'd stand up here and talk about what a big asshole he is. And I said, <laughs> Ludlow, that's between you and your proctologist. I don't have anything to say about that. I think that Ludlow Porch is a great asset to WS... There's that word again. Mm. Anyway, Ludlow really is a great asset to the station. Now, I'm not here to say rude things, hateful things. I'm here simply to share the truth. I, uh, I don't want to engage in any gossip, but I have discovered something. I don't know if you all realize that Ludlow has something in common with Jerry Lee Lewis. Ludlow was very naive as a child. I've learned a lot. I did some digging into his past. He was very naive as a child, and he was also quite shy. And uh, because of that, he ended up falling in love with and marrying the first girl he ever met, which happened to be his 13-year-old cousin, Luella. Now, the only reason I'm telling you this, I wouldn't tell you except that you're going to be reading about it in the book. You see, Luella called me and she wanted to warn all of us at WSB that she would be writing a book about her memoirs. And I said, will it be a kiss and tell book? And she said, honey, Ludlow was so naive, it'll be more like a show and tell book. <laughs> Luella fessed up. She said Ludlow was so naive when he was a little boy, he would go behind the barn and he wouldn't do anything. <laughs> but getting back to this incestuous marriage, it gets much worse. I'm ashamed to say there's a little nepotism involved too. You see, Ludlow and Luella had a child. The child's name, the little boy, was later changed to protect his identity we all know him as Bobby Harper. <laughs> and you always wondered how Harper got the job. In fact, it was only after the birth of this beloved Bobby that the legislature banned inbreeding in Georgia. If you really think about it, you can kind of see the similarities between father and son. Ludlow owns a restaurant. Bobby loves to eat for free. <laughs> Ludlow writes books. 
Bobby's red one. <laughs> Ludlow is happily married. Bobby's been happily married several times. <laughs> Ludlow really has been a great father, except for the time that he dropped little Bobby on his head. And Ludlow told me in his own words, he's been paying the price for that accident every morning of his life, <laughs> 5 to 9 a.m. <laughs> Really, Ludlow is a warm person, and he was a warm, loving father, and he wanted his children to always feel they could come approach him with anything. But he wanted them to feel at ease, so he had a, a really simple method for doing it. In fact, it's so simple, I'm going to show you what Ludlow did. You might want to try this with your own families. For example, there was the time that his son, when he was only 16, came running up to... He said, Dad, my zits are so gross, the girls won't even talk to me, let alone go out. So Ludlow very characteristically compassionate, just simply went <laughs> You've seen these before. You've heard them on his show. And there was the time his daughter came and said, Daddy, I think I've met the man I want to marry. <laughs> you know, Ludlow told me to be a good parent. It just takes a good parent. Too easy. <laughs> In closing, I would only like to say that it really has been an honor to speak here tonight. You know, some people think it would be a big ego boost to be on the morning show with Bobby Harper, and that's, that's fun. I'm learning a lot. But really, to be invited to speak about such a highly esteemed colleague as Ludlow Porch, it just ups my ego probably more than anything that I've ever been invited to do. And Ludlow, I want to say, if, if I'm ever the brunt of a roast, I hope you'll come, and I hope it'll up yours, too. <laughs> Miriam Moad. We're always glad to get all the WSB people we can in one room. You know, any, I've got a 10-year pen there, and that, that's the only one that I know of. It's a... Uh, Kind of weird to work for a place they put your name up in Velcro on the wall. It's uh, something like that. We think Kirk Mellish is good for another six weeks. Uh, you, might, you might know that uh, Kirk is a former member of a heavy metal band. Did you know that? Yeah, uh, Motley Kirk. It's uh, really kind of... But his parents at a very young age locked him in a closet and made him read popular science for seven years straight. And that warped him. Kirk is... Uh, Kirk, you're not really used to being out with grown-ups too much at night, are you? This is, uh, let's see, it's, it's late for you. You know, his, his idea of a big night is dim lights and the weather channel. <laughs> and some hot, steamy talk. And one time he told me he had a barometer party. I don't know what that is. <laughs> Kirk always carries his weather chain. He doesn't pay attention to the computer. He's got a weather chain. Takes it, throws it outside. If he drags his weather chain in wet, he forecasts rain. If he drags it in, it's hot, hot weather. If he throws it out and it's blown away, he's forecasting tornadoes that day. It's... When Kirk applied for the job as Atlanta's only full-time employee of anything in the world, <laughs> including the meteorologist, we conducted a nationwide search for a weatherman, but Kirk was different. He showed up barefoot. Really, we'd had a nice suit on, it was barefoot. That's until we explained that we were interested in what he knew about snow jam instead of toe jam. <laughs> Will you please welcome Kirk Mellish. Dave doesn't even know that I call 976 weather about 5,000 times a day. <laughs> I just like the sound of my voice. <laughs> I don't want to say that Ludlow Porch is a simple man, but he's the only guy I know who likes to be told just the punchline of a joke. <laughs> and he's the only grown man I know to become hypnotized by the WSB rain gauge and thermometer. God forbid he should get the radar channel on cable. <laughs> He'll have to call the paramedics. Yes, just a simple country man, our Ludlow. At the opening of his first Blue Ribbon Grill restaurant, he ordered the maitre d' to get a complimentary can of champagne for every table. <laughs> 
And as many of you already know, Ludlow Porch isn't even his real name, although he's cashing in on it anyway. <laughs> it's really Waldo Heckcrop. <laughs> That's Ludlow Porch backwards. <laughs> but can you really blame him for changing his name? After all, he's had a rough life since childhood. Even his imaginary friend wouldn't talk to him. <laughs> Making it to higher education wasn't easier for Ludlow either. He had to take and pass the college aptitude test. His school didn't even teach aptitude. <laughs> but still, we love him. And you know, when it comes to Ludlow, I think there's something we're all overlooking. I don't know, I'm overlooking it too. <laughs> Actually, Luddy and I actually are close friends. Not a lot of people know this. In fact, I gave him a bottle of my Minoxidil Plus. <laughs> Guaranteed to double your hair growth. <laughs> well, I guess you found out too, let alone. <laughs> Twice nothing is still nothing. <laughs> but, but you know, Luddy, it's, it's like you told me about, about our hair situation, and I, and I love you for it. Every man is born with a fixed amount of male hormones. And I'll be damned if I'll waste mine growing here. <laughs> when I think of Ludlow, I guess I think... Well, I think Ludlow Porch is the Mr. Rogers of radio. <laughs> With his make-believe world of wackos, July Fly, Kitty Litter, puppy, puppy Chow, Bumblebee, all those little characters. In fact, Luddy, I brought a message from one of them. One of your little puppets couldn't be here tonight. Meow, 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 meow. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't know what it means either, but uh, she assured me he would. And the scary part is, I believe her. <laughs> Luddy, I know you'll be up here in a few minutes to say all the good things about you. <laughs> let, let me help you with that. Just remember, Luddy, a sound character is no substitute for good looks. <laughs> Unless you're filthy rich like you, then who the hell cares? Well, our next guest needs no introduction, so I'm not going to give him one. The operator of Clayton County, Forest Park, Georgia's only drive through funeral parlor, lube service, car wash, and now I understand skateboard repair shop, Ciro Greenberg. Come to y'all directly from this podium. This is Cyril Greenberg. I want an operator the only drive in funeral home in the South that I absolutely know anything about. <laughs> I went through this last year. Let me say something about Dave before I get started. Dave uh, subscribes to the philosophy that anybody who eats three meals a day understands why cookbooks outsell sex books three to one. <laughs> Y'all like that and so good, i tell you another one on him. <laughs> Dave's a Baptist. And being a Baptist, he can relate to the fact that cats are a lot like Baptists. They raise hell, but you can't never catch them at it. There's Kathy Fishman. Love of my life. You remember when I tried to date her, don't you, lady? Kathy's uh, twisted, perverted, and sick. I like that in a woman. I don't know anything about Miriam, so I'm not going to say anything about her. The empty limousine pulled up out in front a while ago, and Paul Gonzalez got out. 
I ran into Norman Clature out in the lobby out there a few minutes ago and he gave me four or five philosophies, I suppose, to tell y'all. He said, sex is the most fun you can have without smiling. Now, yeah, well, think about that now. Now, why do we have to go to bed when we ain't sleepy and get up when we are? And Kathy will appreciate this one. Never accept a drink from a urologist. I always thought Kurt, uh, Kurt Mellish and Miller Pope were the same person. <laughs> I've never seen them together. Now here's my friend Porchy. Every time I do one of these things, I find out a little bit more stuff about him. Porchy and Diane had their dog fixed. So now instead of chasing the postman, he chases the hairdresser. <laughs> Porch is a self-made man. That relieves the Lord of a lot of responsibility. <laughs> and when Porchy was young, he used to wet the bed. I mean, he was, he was so good at it, he could do it from the hall. <laughs> but I'm going to tell you, his mama cured him as she bought an electric blanket for him. I'm kind of culling some of this out. They said it run too long. <laughs> Porchy was tending bar out at the Blue Ribbon the other night, and I was out there. And this real important-looking man was sitting there, real, real stuffed shirt, you know. And Porchy went over to him and said, would you like to have a drink? He said, uh, no, I tried liquor one time. I didn't like it. So he kept sitting there and sitting there. So Porchy went back to him a few minutes later and said, would you like to have a cigarette? The man said, no. I said, I tried cigarettes one time, didn't like them. And Porchy said, well, there's a couple of the guys sitting in the back room back there playing poker. Would you like to go sit in on a hand? He said, no, I tried uh, gambling one time. I didn't like that either. He said, I wouldn't even be here if I wasn't waiting for my son. Porchy said, I guess that's your only son. <laughs> Y'all know Porchy likes birds. But the Monsignor had a couple of parrots. And Porchy decided he wanted him one, so he found an ad in the newspaper. Somebody was selling one of these double yellow headed, is that what you call it? One of these double yellow headed Amazon parrots for $100. Well, Porchy just called him up and went over and looked at the parrot, and he liked it, so he, he bought it and took it home. Got home, he set it down on the table, and he pulled the cover off of it. The little old parrot jumped up. She said, I'm a prostitute, I'm a prostitute. <laughs> well, that just shocked him, you know, so he just put the cover back on her. Say, well, good night, sleep. Maybe she'll be better tomorrow. <laughs> Next morning, we down, pulled the cover off. She jumped up and flapped her wings. And she says, I'm a whore, I'm a whore. <laughs> so Porchy's called the Monsignor. He said, I'm having problems. The Monsignor said, well, bring her on over here. So we'll, we'll let, let her associate with my birds for a couple of days. Maybe she'll learn a lot of good stuff. <laughs> Took her over there and set her down, you know, and there's... The Monsignor's birds that had the rosary in there, and they were just moving little beads back and forth, you know, just doing like this. Set the bird down, pull the cover off. She stretched, she said, I'm a whore, I'm a whore. One of the Monsignor's birds looked at us and said, Drop your beads, Charlie, our prayer's been answered. <laughs> I don't know if any of y'all knew this, but Porchy used to be a boxer of some notoriety, so I understand. And he was in a match one night, it was a 10-rounder. And uh, he was sitting in the corner between the ninth and the 10th rounds. His face was bleeding, his eyes were closed. I mean, his seconds was working on him just furiously trying to stop the blood, you know. Porchy's manager looked at him with an awful lot of disgust. He said, I think he's got you whipped. Porchy said, yeah, kind of gazing hazily through half-closed eyes, you know. He said, I should have got him in the first round when he was by himself. (laughs) 
I got so many of these things, I could just go on all night. I want to tell y'all a little story about Ludlow and Lewis. I sure wish Lewis was here. They went to apply for a job one time together. So they filled out the application and they handed it in. They sat out in a little room out there and finally the lady come out and call Porchy in, interview him first. Got him inside and she says, well now, what kind of job have you done in the past? Porchy says, well I used to work for an underwear company and I am the person that sewed the little panel in ladies' underpants. She says, well, I don't think we have anything that would require that kind of expertise. <laughs> and she says, uh, if I ever find anything, I'll call you. So Porchy goes outside and Lewis goes in. Lewis is in there for a long time. Finally, he comes out. Ludlow says, what in the world happened? And then Lewis said, lady, you ain't going to believe it. I said, I got a job paying top pay, 20 bucks an hour. And he said, now, wait a minute. You worked at the same place I did. He said, how in the world did you get a job? Lewis said, I don't know. Ludlow said, well, I'm going to find out. So he goes back in there and he talks to, the, to see the lady. And he said, what's this that you gave Lewis this job? So he worked at the same place I did. And she said, well, he said he was a diesel fitter. And she said, that's a pretty important sounding thing. She said, so I give him a job. And poor she said, well, you know, he worked with me. He said, lady, do you know what a diesel fitter is? And she said, no. He said, well, after I sold the little panel in the lady's underpants, I pass them down to Lewis. Lewis takes them, stretches them out, pulls them down over his head, and if they ain't too tight, he says, diesel fitter. <laughs> I found this in Ludlow's diary last year, and, and uh, I've had a couple of requests to repeat it. Ludlow asked me <laughs> two times. Usually everybody who has a dog calls him Rover or Spot. Porchy had a dog one time, and he named him Six. Well, Six is a very embarrassing name. And one day, Porchy took Six for a walk, and his things will happen sometimes. Six ran away. Porchy spent hours looking for that dog. A policeman came along and asked him what he was doing in an alley at 4 o'clock in the morning. And he said to him he was looking for sex. <laughs> Spent four days in jail. One day he went to City Hall to get a dog license for sex. The clerk asked Porchy what he wanted, and Porchy told him he wanted a license for sex. The clerk said he'd like to have one too. <laughs> Porchy said, but you don't understand, this is for a dog. The clerk said, hold on, Mayor. The clerk said, the clerk said he didn't care how she looked. Porchy said, you don't understand. I've had sex since I was two years old. The clerk said, my, you must have been a strong boy. When Porchy decided to get married, he told the minister he wanted to have sex at the wedding. He told Porchy to wait till after the wedding. Porchy told him that sex had played a big part in his life, and his whole lifestyle revolved around sex. The minister told Porchy that he did not want to hear about his personal life and would not marry them in his church. Porchy told him that everybody that was coming to the wedding would enjoy having sex there. <laughs> the next day they were married by justice of the peace. Porchy took the dog along with him on their honeymoon. And when they checked into the motel, Porchy told the clerk he wanted a room for him and his wife, and a separate room for sex. <laughs> Clerk told Porchy that all the rooms were for sex. <laughs> Porchy told him, you don't understand. Sex keeps me awake at night. <laughs> Clerk said, me too. <laughs> One day, Porchy told me he had sex on TV, and I told him he was a show-off. <laughs> he said it was a contest, and I told him he should have sold tickets. When he and his wife separated, they went to court to fight for the custody of the dog. Porchy told the judge, Your Honor, I had sex before we were married. The judge said, Me too. <laughs> Porchy then told the judge that after he was married, sex left him. The judge said, Join the crowd. <laughs> well, now, Porchy's been thrown in jail, 
married, divorced, and he's had more problems with that dog than he ever counted on. But not long after this, he went to his first session with the psychiatrist. And she asked him what seemed to be his problem. Porchy told her that sex had died and left his life. It was like losing a best friend, and it was so lonely. The doctor said, look, Mr. Porch, you and I both know that sex isn't man's best friend. What you need to do is get yourself a dog. <laughs> this is Ludlow Porch, and I call him my friend. Our next roaster is Kathy Fishman. Yeah. <laughs> Kathy Fishman, the face that bought a thousand slips. <laughs> the woman voted most likely to charge. She's the pinup girl for Saks and Neiman Marcus. You know, that's all a fake image about. I'm sorry, Kathy. I really, I'm sorry. I couldn't let it go. Kathy Fishman is really a redneck. I want y'all to know that right now tonight. She dips snuff, she drives a white Ford pickup truck, and every Friday night she goes to the Dixie Drive-In, and she goes out to the 411 Speedway to watch the Modified Sportsman every Saturday. That's <laughs> Kathy's favorite phrase off the air is, hey Bubba. Really? Also, Kathy's a former lady wrestler who fought on the stage named the Louisiana Lasher. <laughs> yeah, really, a, she's a tough gal. Kathy would like nothing better tonight to, to do away with the barbecue and have a mason jar, some soup beans, some cornbread, and a good old boy in a white T-shirt and a big old plug of red man right there, right at her side. So, Kathy, I know your date's waiting out there. I can hear the truck racing his engine. So let's give a warm welcome to Kathy Fishman. After that warm inter introduction, I'm ready to puke. <laughs> he's laughing now, but when we're all through, you know that mason jar I talked about? He's going to be wearing it. <laughs> all right, now I got to tell you, tonight it's, it's not going to be funny like it usually is, okay? It's going to be, you know, a little bit down because I really wasn't going to be here tonight because I have been under the weather and I've been taking some medication and obviously if the medication had worn off, I wouldn't be here. <laughs> And I certainly never would go have gone after uh, Ciro if I'd known he'd improved so much over last year. <laughs> and I also want to say thanks to uh, Miriam Moed for driving me here. She drove by ear. <laughs> Just tell me if you hear anything. <laughs> you ever seen her drive? Have you seen her car? It's a purse on wheels. <laughs> it's got a little slit in the top for Kleenex. <laughs> In the back seat, it's a graveyard for mascara. <laughs> anyway, oh, and before I forget, before I forget, I want to say hello to someone very special, the Monsignor. What a star. I loved you in MASH. <laughs> in fact, you know, I wish I could be sitting next to you this evening, since no one else wanted to. <laughs> well, Ludlow, I think... That's right, it's come to your time. I wasn't even going to tell Kirk, is that a barometer in your pocket or are you just happy to see me? I'm, I'm not going to be cheap this year. What a change, huh, Ludlow? Um, I think Ludlow has finally stretched himself a little too far. As if it wasn't enough that he owns, let's see, all those money-making restaurants. He has all those published books. He's got that radio show, which I know you make a fortune on because that's how the rest of our salaries are lowered. <laughs> he does those financially profitable speeches, but he had to have more. So now we learn that Ludlow Porch has also become a clothing designer. First he conquered the world of entertainment and now the world of high fashion. In fact, if you buy any of his fashions, you have to be high. <laughs> I wish Ludlow the best, but I'm not sure about the label he's designing under. Plaid to be alive. <laughs> yes, friends, it's the wardrobe that promises to make a statement and at the same time jam enemy radar. Take, for instance, the formal wear. 
please. It includes stunning silk overalls in three shades of gingham for that extra special evening. Look at Kirk, he's wearing some of those items tonight. Well, in fact, the only person I won't pick on tonight is Bob Neal, because I may have been born at night, but not last night. Well, I guess Ludlow's designing comes as a surprise to many of you, but certainly not to some of us on the dais, some of Ludlow's few friends who know him at the station. After all, Luds, we've known your secret for many years, the one you've held in your heart so long, and now it's out. Ludlow Porch is a woman. <laughs> it's true. Ludlow is a woman, or as we know him at work, Loretta. <laughs> I pray someday, Ludlow, you'll forgive me for spilling the beans. I will be checking under the hood of my car, though, when we leave. But these people love you, Ludlow, and I'm sure they'll understand. And if they don't, to hell with them. I realize some of you are probably very shocked, and you may not believe me, but I do have the proof that Ludlow is a woman. Do you want to hear the proof? Yeah. I'm not going to show you pictures, because Diane is here. All right, here's the proof. First of all, why is Ludlow constantly seen coming out of the ladies' lounge? Smiling. I once heard him ask Miriam Moad if the shirt he was wearing made him look too busty. I heard him ask Dave Folk recently that since he needed a new outfit for tonight, he wanted to go to the mall together to help him try on clothes. He was looking for something sparkly. One day, I couldn't find the number of my manicurist, and, like, I panicked... Ludlow not only knew the number off the top of his head, but he offered to do the nails himself. And he did a fabulous job. He asked Miriam, two secretaries, and me one day if we wanted to get together for an old-fashioned slumber party. He said, you know, we'll talk about boys and do each other's hair. He offered to do Kirk's colors. He redecorated Bob Neal's office in fuchsia. He said it made the place warm and fuzzy. <laughs> on several occasions, this has not happened once, on several occasions, Miller and I have walked by Ludlow's office and we heard him singing several verses of I enjoy being a girl. <laughs> Someone once got a pink slip at the station. Uh, hard to believe at our station, right? Uh, someone got a pink slip at our station. Ludlow was appalled. We thought he felt sorry for the person. He went, pink, pink, black is so much sexier. <laughs> He's got a Mel Gibson 16 by 20 poster in his office. He put it up after he got tired of the one of Jim Palmer. <laughs> and now, the most incriminating proof of all. You see before you a Fredericks of Hollywood catalog. Dave, would you stand up, please? I'm not in that catalog. I want you to see who it's addressed to. Just read it, please. It is addressed to Ludlow Porch, WSB Radio. Honest to Pete. And the items circled include crotchless undies. <laughs> I'm sorry, Ludlow, I had to do it. And finally, oh, by the way, they said the gold card, very soon. And finally, the biggest reason of all why I know beyond the shadow of a doubt that Ludlow Porch is a woman is because I heard it on Paul Gonzalez's show. <laughs> Kathy Fishman. Kathy, will you watch that Frederick's uh, catalog because Gonzalez is next, and you know how he is. Around, so. Paul, it's good you could come out tonight. I know you had to break a dinner date you had with Elvis. Thank you very much. Boy, that's weird. You get some of the strangest calls in the Western Hemisphere. You know, Paul Gonzalez is this year's poster child for the National Enquirer. Did you know that? <laughs> Gonzalez even attracts weird people, like the, like the women he dates. He took one out the other night, opened the door for her, she jumped in the back seat right away, then stuck her head out the window. <laughs> it's really weird. And there's one thing Gonzalez is proud about, and that's his Hispanic background, and, and rightfully so. He took me to a Mexican restaurant the other day and ordered in his native tongue. I was quite impressed until the waiter brought out a cat wrapped in a towel and said, here's what you ordered, sir. I... 
So now, I bring you the only man who really knows if Elvis Presley was kidnapped by space aliens, forced into a sex change, and is now a Satan worshiper who works at Dunkin' Donuts on Roswell Road, I give you none other than Paul Gonzalez. <laughs> Folk, it was your fault I was late tonight. Dave Folk says, just head towards Alpharetta and you'll see uh, the road. So I got to Alpharetta and figured no. that I was a little bit out of the way. And I asked them if there were any Catholic churches around, and they said, we don't have any Catholic churches around here. But anyway, they pointed me to the right direction. And these people, you know, they're talking so much about my program having so much sex. What did we talk about? We talked about sex, the dog. What did we talk about? Ludlow being a girl. But I'll tell you what, folks, I had a little bit of a culture shock when I came to Atlanta. Bob Neal, bless his soul, he asked me to listen to Ludlow for a few days. And uh, so... The first day I went on the air, you know, I was really nervous about it. So I studied up on psychology and all those kind of things. And my first call was, how do you get squirrels out of the attic? <laughs> Hell, they didn't teach that in the Columbia School of Broadcasting. <laughs> Heck, I don't know. I, I guess use poison. That's what I use. Uh, I prefer strychnine. So, so then I'm going along a little farther into the evening and... Get my next call. Paul, I'm hoping, oh boy, I can answer this question. How do I get rabbits out of my garden, Ludlow? And I said, shoot them and we'll have rabbit stew. <laughs> I know it's a little bit sick humor, but then things started straightening up. He started doing something that I could relate to politics, you know, outside of Elvis and UFOs and things like that. And I turn on the radio and I hear about this drinking license. Did you all hear about that? How many heard about the drinking license? Here I turn, well, a lot, of them, a lot of you all didn't hear about it, so let me tell you. First day, you know, I tune in to Ludlow when he's talking about politics, and here he is. The state of Georgia is going to charge $250 a year for a drinking license. Doesn't that sound like a great idea? And then uh, if you want to do it on holidays, like some of us Catholics do, you can get $50 for, you know, a holiday permit. And then, of course, 50 cents for communion. Well, that's, that's a pretty good deal. So I go along, you know, and I figure this, this guy really, really knows what he's doing. And here he is, a philosopher in the South. I mean, he is the only man to do a sociological explanation of poor white trash. And have you all heard about that? He wrote a book called Who Cares About Apathy? And here are some of the astounding facts that good old Luddy has, has picked up for us. Poor white trash, only park and handicap spaces. Poor white trash starts smoking cigarettes at the age of 12. Poor white trash contain about 85% of the toothpick market. So, you know, this man has got quite a bit of class. Well, Luddy, you're a fine American. I really appreciate the fact that uh, you've supported me so much, even though I told the world that Elvis Presley is alive. Luddy, I love you, and thank you for having me here tonight. Well, our next person is Scott Slade. Two places in one time. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Two places in one time. Just ask his wife. You're late. You can't be there and here at the same time. Scott, you enjoying your dinner tonight? Do you eat like the cue and the stew? No. I'm on it. I kill somebody for some barbecue. No, I'm on it. No, I don't want the rest of yours. I was out in my backyard a little while ago before I came up here trying to trap squirrels to eat, and here I am. Scott's been on... Uh, uh, selling the Nutrisystem. You hear those commercials every morning, you know, on AM 750 WSB. Truth about Scott, he's never been fat in his life. And here he is uh, selling diets and all this. That's disgusting. Ought to be a, a law against skinny people selling. You all agree with that? <laughs> be a law against. That's right. Scott's rough on helicopters. And I was rough on helicopters. Scott's worse. Matter of fact, Scott, out in the lobby, there's a box of parts that the airport's collected out from your takeoff pattern. A little lady brought them by. She said, they fell off your machine. If you don't want them, we'll just sell them for scrap after the uh, roast. Scott is a licensed pilot. That doesn't mean much. They gave me a license to carry a gun. Think about that. <laughs> but he's, Scott has really improved since he took over from me. When I, when I 
stopped flying and the WSB sky copters got, got right in there. And it's taken several years, but we have finally broke him of the habit of throwing empty Coca-Cola cans down on stalled cars. <laughs> Will you please welcome Scott Slade. Have you eaten yet, by the way? No. no. One of the greatest lines I ever heard Ludlow Porch use and my friend Dave Folk is that, Dave, he's like a man going to the electric chair. <laughs> Dave Folk is to barbecue what China is to rice. <laughs> there is none. Kathy Fishman had to leave early. The sick thing was just a, a ruse, okay? She's not, she's not really ill. She had to go uh, over to Phipps Plaza and supervise the ground crew pulling the tarp over her VIP parking space. <laughs> no, she... Uh, she really was ill. Uh, it's very nice she was here. And thank you for inviting me here tonight. You've heard the expression, he had a face that would make a freight train take a dirt road. <laughs> Lud Ludlow Porch, Ludlow Porch's face was the first face I saw at WSB. And I've been stuck in traffic ever since. <laughs> How do you make fun of a nice guy? I mean, that was the hard... I was really reluctant to come here tonight. I mean, how do you make fun of a really nice person? How do you think of something derogatory, demeaning, embarrassing, even shockingly truthful to say about a person like Ludlow Porch? I found five or ten minutes the other day and uh, wrote down a couple of thoughts. First of all, he's got an MBA, a law degree, a Golden Gloves title, a shelf full of books, a full dance card in the after-dinner circuit, spot him one marriage and one TV show, and he's had a successful life so far. I did find something uh, the other day, Luddy. An old interview from your high school newspaper, Russell High School. Ludlow doesn't brag about this much because he was really a lousy football player. But one of the reporters there did find him and had an interview with him, and the interview went like this. Ludlow, how long have you been playing football for Russell High School? Ludlow goes, eh, five years. Well, how long have you been playing on the A-team, Lud? Uh, two years. What is your last name, Ludlow? Uh, Porch. Ludlow Porch. Now, wait a minute. I get this bit for the, uh, uh, for the number of years. What's this? Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. <laughs> Happy birthday, Ludlow Porch. Happy <laughs> The first time I heard Ludlow Porch, and this is another true story. I mean, I don't have a lot of great one-liners like these other guys. Just true stories tonight. Everything I owned was in the back of the rider truck that I was driving from Cincinnati, Ohio, back to my hometown of Griffin, Georgia, late one May night. And I'm about two hours out of Atlanta on I-75, and I only have an AM radio in the truck, which is okay. I grew up listening to AM radio. I've worked at it all my life. And I said, I think I'll tr switch on WSB and see what um, my next home is broadcasting about. So what the hairy is this? This guy named Ludlow Porch on WSB. It sounds like a good old boy doing Marlon Brando impersonations with a little testosterone thrown in <laughs> to get his voice down. Listen to this. Yeah, this is my son, Michael. How y'all? Lower that a little bit. That's Luddy, isn't it? Complete with the marbles in his mouth, right? Real laid back, talking to people like Carnival Man and Kitty Litter. And I don't recall who all. It sounded like a 50,000-watt CB radio. <laughs> Since then, I have come to know and love him. I don't love him as much as his accountants, Dewey, Cheatham, and Howe, <laughs> or his partners in his restaurant business. He dresses down a little bit, but uh, he does have money. The only reason we haven't changed the call letters to WLUD is they don't want to blow all that stationery they've already printed. <laughs> Everybody says how nice he is. Well, he is on the radio. Think about all the times he has said, come to see us, cousin. And then think about all the times he's given out his home address on the air. <laughs> Let me tell you, that thing is locked up with a Coke formula, okay? And the combination passed with Robert Woodruff some time ago. 
All I know is that he lives up around Roswell somewhere. The only way I know that is I see his car in traffic on Georgia 400 every morning. I know it's his. It has Edith the Blue Ribbon Grill stenciled on the top of it. <laughs> Ludlow does love his cars. He wants to own more of them than Elvis did. But don't you mess with them. Don't you mess with those cars. Don't you ding one in a parking lot. Don't you take anything off the front seat. There's a bumper sticker on the back of Ludlow's Cadillac. It says, this vehicle protected by a pit bull with AIDS. <laughs> Real nice guy. Buddy and I do share a couple of things in common. A love of the mountains and a sense of survival. Reminds me of the time that Ludlow and I were out hiking along the Appalachian Trail. Something else you didn't know. Ludlow's an avid outdoorsman. We're out there on that trail. It's getting lonely in the evening. We're on the way back to the house. And out of a tree, out of nowhere, <laughs> drops this mountain lion. A real hungry mountain lion, snarling at us with saliva dripping off his teeth. I knew he was a meat eater the first time I saw him. Terrible, terrible thing. I knew we were going to get et or ate or eaten, depending on where you're from. <laughs> Ludlow, meanwhile, starts to take off his backpack. I said, Ludlow, what are you doing? You know you can't outrun no mountain lion. Luddy looked me right in the eye and said, Scott, I don't have to outrun that mountain lion. I only have to outrun you. He's a great American, and I'm proud to call him my friend, Letty. Thank you, pal. Our next guest, guest is an officer of the law. Stopped the car on the way down here. Said, uh, can, I, can I see your license? And he gave a license. And the uh, old lady in the back seat said, don't pay no attention to him. Said, that man said, whatever he tells you, officer, said he's been drunk since he left the house. <laughs> he let him go. I don't know about this guy, Milton Crabapple. He does sound a whole lot like Jimmy Stewart, though, don't you think? <laughs> Here's Milton Crabapple. God darn Ludlow. <laughs> now, I don't know too much about these roasts, but I was asking a fella what they done. He said, well, usually when you get up to talk about somebody, it's just like spreading guanner. You just lay it on thick. <laughs> But he said, all you got to do, Milton, is just stand up and tell the truth about Ludlow. That's all you got to do. Well, sir, I'm here to tell the truth. Oh, hell. <laughs> now, now, there comes a time sometimes in people's lives when a fella gets to spreading his wings, and sometimes he gets them spread out just a little bit too far to where he thinks he's soaring around over everybody else's head. And the responsibility falls on his friends and neighbors to clip them wings. Yes, sir. And Ludlow's been a needing a wing clipping, if you ask me. <laughs> now, the first time I ever seen Ludlow, it was on one of them TV specials, and they showed him in that little booth down at the radio station, and he was sitting there all bloused out on this stool, talking in his microphone and some woman was a talking to him real serious like and it showed him a sitting there and he was a sipping on a cup of coffee and a smoking a cigarette and a doodling on a little pad and a reading a book and a talking to somebody else and he weren't no more paying attention to what that woman said than the man in the moon no sir no sir all he's interested in is that paycheck Yes, sir. And it's a good one, too. I know exactly how much it is on account of Miller told me. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I ain't got much money, but what I got, I made it the old-fashioned way. I earned it and worked hard for it. But not that girl during Ludlow. 
No, sir. He makes it the newfangled way. He just kind of stumbles into it. Yes, sir. <laughs> now, I ain't saying he's, he's chinchy with his money, but something happened a while back I think you folks ought to know about. Now, I was driving my pickup truck up the road, and I seen this fella hitchhiking on the side of the road, and he had about five suitcases with him. And it was one of them hot days, and he had a big piece of cardboard holding it up, and it said Nashville. Well, I stopped, and the fella started to throw in them suitcases over in the back, and I got to looking, and it was Miller Pope. <laughs> and he was a-sweating and a-throwing them suitcases in the back, and when he got them loaded up, he, he looked off up in the woods and said, Come on, Ludlow. <laughs> well... Now, out from under a shade tree stepped Ludlow. He had one of them folding chase lounge chairs in his hand. And he had him one of them little pot-bellied glasses with one of them pink drinks in it with one of them little umbrellas and a little curly cue straw. And he had on a straw hat. And I said, Miller, what in tarnation are you and Ludlow doing out hitchhiking on the road? He said, well, Milton, that... Ralph Emery fella called up and wanted Ludlow to tape another one of them shows. And they said they was going to pay for his room and his meals, but he was going to have to provide his own transportation up to Nashville. <laughs> yes, sir. Now, he thinks he's hot stuff down at White Columns, but not if you ask me, no, sir. Why, well, he invited me down to see him once, and I walked in, and they got a real nice lady that sits in the lobby or running the switchboard and taking care of things and she said may I help you I said well, I come to see Ludlow and she opened up a little book and said Ludlow I said that's right she said is that his first name or his last name <laughs> Ma Crabapple thought she seen him on Nashville now one night and called me and said Milton come look Ludlow's on TV and I got to looking but it weren't him though no, sir. This fella looked like Ludlow, but he weren't funny like Ludlow. <laughs> no, sir. He was just a standing there telling a bunch of old Louis Grizzard jokes. <laughs> yes, <sir. laughs> Ludlow was talking about football the other day, high school football, and how he used to play football now. Just so happened I run into a fella that played football with Ludlow in high school. And I asked him, I said, was Ludlow a good football player? He said, no, sir, he weren't worth a hoot. No, sir. I said, how come? He said, well, he didn't have no football sense about him at all. He said he'll never forget the first day Ludlow come out on the field. And the coach come up to him and handed him a football and said, can you pass this thing, Ludlow? <laughs> And Ludlow, Ludlow said, well, if and I can swallow it, I can. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> and he said, he asked the coach if any mind if he let the air out of it first. <laughs> yes, sir. Now, Ludlow, Ludlow claims he's got a place up in the mountains, but I ain't never seen it, and I ain't never met nobody that's seen it. <laughs> no, sir. Now, I've heard lots of folks call up and ask where it was. Why, he, if, they, if they was to say it was in China, he'd say, yeah, it's around there somewhere. <laughs> well, sir, he ain't going to tell nobody where it is. I reckon he's afraid somebody might drop by and try to be nice to him or something. <laughs> And him and that god darn Frymeyer. <laughs> Why, it's a... Ain't no telling that the innocent folks they've killed over the last two years. <laughs> now, I ain't... I ain't been... I ain't been to the doctor in 30 years. I ain't been to the doctor in 30 years, and I tried one of them concoctions and ended up having to go to the doctor three times just to get myself straightened out. Oh. 
But I want to tell you something. I want to tell you something. You can talk about your faith healers and your, and your folkologists and all these potions, but I'm telling you something serious now. Listening to Ludlow Porch on that WSB has got a healing power all of its own. And you can just ask anybody that's been shut up, ain't been able to get out, needing a little uplifting, needing their spirit healed a little bit, just ask them if in Ludlow Porch can't heal folks. Yes, sir. Why, trying to count all the... Trying to count all the good things Ludlow Porch does for folks would be like trying to count bulls in a cotton field. Yes, sir. I love Ludlow Porch, I'll guarantee you. And if you ask me, Atlanta and the Southeast and this whole god darn United States would be a whole lot less if in Ludlow weren't around. I'm much obliged to you. Bob Neal. Those of you that thought Dave Falk was funny and want to hear him a lot more often, he'll be pumping gas at the Standard Station right down the street. Actually, Mr. Neal couldn't be here tonight. Uh, I'm his son. People came up to me tonight and said, you know, you're so young to be a general manager of a radio station. I, Twenty people came up to me and said that. What they really don't know is that Mike Faraday, who was our former general manager, promoted me to this job because I have pictures of him with a goat. <laughs> Honestly, this is, uh, this is a big honor for me to, uh, to be speaking about this gentleman here who I've been listening to since I was this big. <laughs> Seriously, I was, I was here a couple of years ago. Uh, a couple of years ago, the Knights of Columbus all up on Buford Highway, when Hosea Williams was there. And I decided, you know, I think I can probably do this, because all you have to do is have 30 drinks and lie a lot. <laughs> well, this is getting to be old hat. I mean, we've roasted Ludlow so many times, this is getting to be leftovers. There's no roast to it. This year, though, he's a leaner cut. He's lost, uh, lost a few pounds. As a matter of fact, he's lost a lot of weight this year. In fact, everybody at the radio station at one time or another has been on Nutrisystem or Jenny Craig. I mean, combined, we must have lost 1,000 pounds, 2,000 pounds among everybody at the radio station. But you know something? That it was really just a business move on his part. You can't own restaurants and look like Karen Carpenter. <laughs> Actually, the real reason he's lost weight is, along with his books and his restaurants and radio shows and everything else, he's opening up a new business. It's the Ludlow Porch Nudist Colony. <laughs> and don't forget our motto, come see us. <laughs> Actually, he bought the place so he'd have somewhere to hang out. He said he'd broadcast live from there, but the only thing he doesn't want to see sagging is the ratings. And when he talks to Kitty Litter and says how happy he is to see her, we'd have a pretty good idea if he was telling the truth or not. <laughs> you may have heard a lot of talk about what a great guy Ludlow is. He's a celebrity in his own right, admired even by other celebrities. In fact, just the other day, Paul Gonzalez told me that Elvis told him how much he respects and admires Ludlow Porch. But it's, but it's true. You don't find many people like Ludlow in our business, and in fact, you don't find too many people like him outside of a straitjacket. He's a pretty busy guy. He's got all these things going on, doing radio, writing books, running these restaurants. But that's not enough for him. He's always looking for new businesses. In fact, I don't know if you know it, he has a third cousin removed that he's going into business with. Uh, his third cousin is Rob Lowe Porch. <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> and uh, I understand this new company is going to fit right in with his restaurant business because his cousin Rob Lowe is into breasts and buns too. <laughs> and of course the slogan still fits, come see us, all of us. <laughs> well, they called me and asked me to get up here and do this roast. I said, you know, I'm a busy guy. I got things to do. I got people to fire. Like, like you, you, and you. He answered nasty letters about Paul Gonzalez's sex show on devil worship or whatever it is. I know, you know. Competitors to crush, naps to take, that kind of thing. So I said, give me just ten reasons why I should, why I should do this. Why should I roast Ludlow? Ten reasons. So they came up with ten of them. You got to roast someone and we need the money. Hosea Williams was busy this year. What else does Ludlow have to do on a Friday night? Despite losing all the weight, he still has a passion for a free meal. Never misses an opportunity for a Maalox moment. Ludlow heard it was a great way to meet babes. <laughs> now that he's lost weight, people can't make fun of him for being fat anymore, so he wants to come and see what we will make fun of and what's wrong with him. <laughs> He thought this would be an event to rival Woodstock. <laughs> he heard that Louis Grizzard started this way. And the Gold Club was closed tonight. But the real reason they asked me to speak was because they knew I'd be short. <laughs> so I just want to say very sincerely, Ludlow, you're a talented, caring, entertaining individual. I admire you professionally, personally. And a person like you is very, very difficult to find. But if I do, and he works cheaper, your, your history. For years you've been hearing about Ludlow Porch's relationship with Louis Grizzard. You know, that's all bunk. He's not. He's not related. Ludlow is actually the half-brother of Maynard Jackson. You know what I'm <laughs> kind of a size resemblance, say. Luddy's in trouble with his wife. They were getting ready to come down here this evening, and he told her her seams weren't straight. She told him she didn't have her stockings on yet. <laughs> You're right, Milton. Luddy is a skin flint. He really is. He's really tight. He's gone into recycling parsley at the Blue Ribbon Grill. <laughs> That's right. Well, it's bad. It's bad. You ever seen him come around and get the rolls? About, you, you're not going to eat that, are you? Well, it's bad. <laughs> hey, Ludlow had an all-you-can-eat special for $4, so I took him up on it. Went up there. I got one portion of meatloaf, half a thing of corn souffle, and a little bitty old salad. I said, I thought this was all you can eat for four dollars. He said, that's right, that's all you can eat for four dollars. <laughs> Luddy's lazy, too. He's got a little dog at home. Doesn't have a big dog. He's got a little dog, so he had to train the dog to get the paper a section at a time and drag it in. It's, it makes us call him sir in front of everybody at the radio station. It's kind of embarrassing. But all in all... I think everybody here on the dais dreads this moment because it's our turn now to sit and listen and be roasted ourselves. Here he is, the man of the hour, WSB's Ludlow Porch. Sitting, uh, sitting here listening to this, I was struck with one thought. If I had my life to live over, would I be here tonight? <laughs> Dave Folk, I, I want to thank you, Dave, for coming out. Hosea couldn't be here this year. <laughs> I want to tell you a, a couple of truths absolutely true Dave Folk stories and he will not deny either one of these <clears throat> absolutely true you don't have to write anything about Dave Folk just follow him around <laughs> Dave 
told me that he was going on one of Dr. Cooper's diets. It's been several weeks ago. And he said, but I changed my mind and thought better about it. He said, I'm just going to cut back on fried foods, and I think I can lose enough weight eating fried food, and not eating fried foods. So that's all I'm going to do is going to cut back and not eat any fried foods. Remember this, Dave? Yeah. True, true story. Yeah. One of our listeners, a dear lady, came by the station, and she brought for all the staff a huge pan of homemade chocolate eclairs. <laughs> There must have been 200 chocolate eclairs on that thing, and they looked great, and they were just dripping chocolate. It's a true story. I walked in the newsroom just as Dave was biting a chocolate eclair in half. And I said, boy, Dave, it's a damn good thing that's not fried, isn't it? Another true story. He's on a diet right now, a serious diet. Another true story. My hand on the Bible, honest Monsignor. I'm an honorary Monsignor, so I must tell the truth. <laughs> this man went on a diet. One week later, the Zestos across the street from the radio station closed. <laughs> That's true. I talked to his wife earlier about his diet. She said he had to go on a diet because the electric bill on the refrigerator bulb alone was $22 a month. <laughs> I'm sorry Mary Moad had to leave. She was, she was acting as driver for sweet Kathy, and, uh, and Kathy wasn't feeling well. But So I, I wanted Mary to be here because Mary is one of the cutest, sweetest, loving, giving persons I've ever known cute as a button, but I'm going to tell you, when they handed out jugs, she was standing behind the door. <clears throat> what, you, uh, what you hear in the morning is pretty much what she is, kind of giggly, kind of flighty. Uh, she is, uh, and she wouldn't tell you this, but I will. She's going for a minor operation next week. They're going to put in a brain. <laughs> she was taking a, a minor injury, only minor injury. She was taking a milk bath the other day, and the cow fell on her. Wears a size 32 bra <laughs> and an IQ to match. <laughs> Mary, <laughs> Mary's a newlywed. They've only married about a year. Her, her husband told me that when they first got married, she used to smoke after they made love. And then she got where she'd smoke before they made love. And he's a little upset because now she's smoking while they make love. <laughs> My friend Kirk Mellish, Kirk, I'm going to level with you. Nobody gives a damn where you live. <laughs> Kirk Mellish, Kirk Mellish is sort of the, uh, the Barney Fife of radio. <laughs> Uh, in defense of the present management, none of them were there when they hired Kirk. <laughs> True story. They, they hired Kirk. Kirk was living in Chicago, and uh, they agreed to pay his transportation from Chicago to Atlanta. So, of course, he rode the Greyhound bus down. <laughs> Kirk is not a real sophisticated guy. You, you may have gotten that impression from hearing him in the morning. <laughs> Got off, got off the bus station in Atlanta, knew that a celebrity status was right around the corner. Got his, got his suitcase, left the Greyhound bus station, walked across the street to the Chateau Switchblade down across from the bus station. (laughs) 
walked in there and, and ordered a drink, just kind of soaking in the atmosphere and enjoying his new city and the new life that was opening up to him. And about that time when he was all comfortable at the bar, a lady of the evening who worked that area wiggled into that bar. Kirk had never seen anything like this. Old girl was wearing tight clothes, had rouge on her cheeks. She wiggled in there and sat out on the bar stool beside him, and Kirk thought he's going to get lucky. <laughs> and she looked him right in the eye, and she said, I'll do anything, anything for $200. And Kirk dug down into his Sansabel pants <laughs> pulled out two one hundred dollar bills, handed them to her and said, Paint my house. <laughs> Paul Gonzalez, one of the dullest men I've ever known in my life, was the ground cold when you got up this morning, Paul? <laughs> this man's favorite color is brown. Goes to health food stores to watch the bread mold. Paul, I got a great way to. Well, I'll tell everybody, I've got a great way to help Paul's ratings. First, you make a tape, then you put it over Paul's mouth. <laughs> Paul, Paul gets kind of philosophical around the station sometimes. He told me just today, he said, You know, Letty, smoking is like sex, they both give you something to do with your hands. <laughs> Scott Slade, the captain of the clouds. I know that's his title because I see him in the hall all the time. He says, I'm Scott Slade, captain of the clouds. <laughs> Scott's, Scott's first job at WSB years ago was as my producer. I didn't like him then. <laughs> and I ain't crazy about him now. We're talking bland here, gang. Scott Slade's so bland, <laughs> he carries a piece of Velveeta cheese in his wallet for ID. <laughs> what, what do you say about a man who regards the highlight of his life as being a prostate exam? Milton, after all the nice things Milton said about me, it's very difficult to say anything harsh about you, Milton, so I won't. But I just want to point out to you, before you vote for Milton Crabapple, for Sheriff of Crabapple, remember this man was, is a convicted felon. He was once convicted of sodomy while he was alone. Ciro Greenberg, owner of the BBC, Bodies by Ciro. <laughs> Look at that face. <laughs> Looks like his hobby stepping on rakes. <laughs> and I want you to realize that necrophilia was not against the law until he went to the funeral home business. <laughs> I'm not, uh, Kathy, Kathy's not feeling well, and I'm afraid God would get me if I said anything bad about Kathy, but I will say this. Kathy is pretty much like a car radio. She'll freeze up pretty quick if you don't keep her full of alcohol. I, 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 
I had some other Kathy material, but Kathy came out of a sick bed to be with us tonight. My heart would not be in it. Bob Neal, Vice President and General Manager of WSB Radio. We call him Skippy around the station. <laughs> it's really kind of embarrassing because every time he talks to me, Sometime in the conversation, he always says this. He says, Jeepers, Mr. Porch. <laughs> He's a pretty tough boss. This is a guy <laughs> that you couldn't warm up to if you were cremated together. <laughs> But I, I don't want you to think it's been, it's been easy for him. When, when he was made vice president and general manager of WSB Radio, which is a big job, he was so choked up and so emotional that all he could manage to say was, Thanks, Dad. <laughs> and he does have another distinction. Uh, Cox Broadcasting own, owns many, many radio stations across the country. Bob Neal has a distinction of being the only vice president and general manager of Cox Broadcasting that has a sandbox in his office. <laughs> I've, had, I've had a good time tonight in, in spite of all the, uh, all the harshness, but I do want to say, I do want to say something kind of serious if, if I could for a minute. It's been my privilege to, to be able to help the Knights of Columbus with this drive for the last few years. God love you, gentlemen. You're, you, through your help, people who used to be locked away in attics are now people who are out earning their own living thanks to efforts like yours. I've had a great time tonight.